But I think what I would like to do is head right into um, there's uh, into the meditation because we have three meditations that I'd like to try to do, uh, or two meditations, and um, let me do some meditations in some journey, so I don't, I'm not sure how many I'm going to do. Um, and I want to just kind of head right in. Um, so, um, have you all gotten a good understanding of Vajrasattva and Vajrasattva's nature as a purification deity and as um, a, a field of energy that can remove karmic traces or help you remove obstacles that might be arising, arising from some kind of karmic engagement either within yourself or that you become aware of through your engagement with another. Um, and uh, the important thing to remember about Vajrasattva is that Vajrasattva is, um, again, the gateway to the Tantra, often called the gateway to the Tantra because of um, the purification practices that are, th and rituals and initiations that Vajrasattva uh, generates um, for the initiate in terms of this clearing process. So that the clearing, so that, so what the clearing does is the clearing establishes a basis for further work or that which can take a variety of forms. It can be in the form of devotional practice or uh, a more catalytic practice um, of gathering and understanding uh, power and sort of being able to enter into that stepping stone of moving toward being able to hold awareness of as much universal power as you can and as much um, capacity to be able to, if you're working on the bodhisattva or the shamanic path, to be able to hold that power in ordinary reality so that other people might benefit uh, on their own path through exposure to the way in which you might hold universal power and offer your gifts through that holding. Each one has their own gifts. You don't have to be a shaman or a yogi or a lama to be um, creating a difference. Um, and the fewer obscurations that we have, the more likely we are to be able to bring forward um, our gifts and be able to enliven and empower them and move with them in the universal flow. So this is the idea of entering into the meditation with Vajrasattva to help purify any obstacles that would keep you from being able to step along that path. So just allow yourself to get settled. Noticing all the places where the surface under you meets the different parts of your body. And as you do, just noticing where your breath is.
just watching your breath for a little while. And just allowing yourself as you continue to breathe to draw your breath into that place within you where everything that you've ever known or felt or sensed or dreamed or imagined is recorded. And as you come into this place, just allowing all of your inner senses to open widely and fully. Your inner sense of taste, touch, and smell. Your inner sense of sight and hearing. But especially that sixth sense of just knowing. Allowing yourself to let all of your senses open fully and widely. And as you do this, just becoming aware of the experience of the clear light. and the experience of your guide that you met in shamanic journey. And asking your guide to help ground and stabilize as you allow yourself to become aware again of the nature of the clear light.
and its connection to the clear light. yourself <clears throat> with all of your senses open, connected with the field of Vajrasattva. Which is a configuration that holds the clear light in an accessible and practical way to help you purify any obstacle that you may wish to bring into the field. So just allow yourself now to focus on the karmic pattern or the emotional response or the relationship to circumstance or another person that you identified yesterday as something that is obscuring your capacity to be able to become as aware and as conscious and as connected to your own Buddha nature and to the universal field in as powerful and clear way as possible. And as you become aware of this issue that you've identified, allow yourself to notice the different parts of your body 
that I mentioned, noticing where you feel the presence of this experience of this obscuration or this difficulty or this karmic pattern or this emotional response that has caused you difficulty or that you have been wondering about or puzzling about. Just noticing any physical sensation that might indicate where in your body or in your energy field you experience the disruption of this issue that you're looking at. Noticing your head and face, your neck and throat, noticing your back and spine and just allowing yourself to become aware of any physical sensations that might indicate the presence of this issue in your energy field or in your body. Noticing your chest and belly, all the organs in your chest and belly. Noticing your arms and hands, Noticing your hips and bottom and your legs and feet. And just allow yourself to become aware of where you experience this obscuration or this conundrum or this difficulty in a way that you might not normally be aware of. Just noticing where when you touch into this issue, you might feel a particular physical or energetic sensation. And allow yourself to stay focused on that cessation as you, and stay focused on the conundrum or the difficulty or the issue that you would like to purify. As you breathe deeply into that part of your body where you feel or that part of your energy field where you feel the disruption. And if you don't feel it in any particular place, breathe deeply into the bottom of your belly. And ask Vajrasattva to move in to this situation, bringing his capacity or her capacity man. 
insight and understanding about this issue as you And then just allowing yourself to return to your normal breath, breathing in, breathing out. <coughs> Again, feeling the stabilizing influence of your guide from the shamanic journey. Feeling the presence of Vajrasattva. reflecting on what you are learning or what you have learned by focusing on this difficulty or this obstacle in this way and noticing how you might feel differently after this process in relationship to this issue.
And then when you're ready, just allow yourself to feel the surface under you again. Notice again all the places where it meets the different parts of your body. And then when you're ready, just come back gently into the room, taking all the time that you need. And go ahead and, re and write down or reflect on this process. We won't have any talking during that time. Do need more time? Okay, take your time. What I'd like to do is have you talk about this experience with someone that you haven't really talked to yet in the class. So I'm just going to share your experience. Here up. Two. There's ten. Yeah, this is an even number. So just, just talk about what that experience was for you, and each one of you can share. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then um, uh, 
what I was I able to do is sitting in this position, in the middle, and then these um, mathematical lines came around me and him, her, like that. Mm -hmm. And then there was a jewel, like a diamond, in each one. I don't know if you know the concept of Indra's net, where um, she casts a wide net over the universe, and everyone's connected through the jewel. So, but it was very geometric. Um, and then um, I've been having problems on my right side, and the pain came on the left side, which was kind of, excuse me, been having problems on my left side, it came on my right side, but it was still in my neck. So I imagined the issue, which was being rejected by someone in fourth grade who I had been best friends with, mm -hmm. and thinking that I did something wrong, mm -hmm. which is what she said yesterday, is think about you were innocent, and um, what I realized at that point is when I let go, it was because I didn't like the talking and I thought I did what she wanted me to do, so then I projected she would like me. When I showed her what I did, it was buying a pair of shoes, and they were patent leather. And she said, the patent leather on the stone is it right? It's one of my most strongest memories. But it was like losing my best friend, and then I was trying to do all this stuff, convincing my mother to buy them. They were really designer, they were expensive, blah, blah, blah. And um, I realized that there was a space on this side between me and the memory that all the control of the experiences were me. By those angular lines, but that her issue is her issue. So even if you want her to do something, it has nothing to do with me, and it's not a rejection of me. So then I was able to my neck, and I've been having control issues, and suicidal tension in my neck, the shoulders. So, um, biologically, when there's tension here, this computer, it pulls on your neck. So, I'm having a rash today, so I thought, I tell her it's this, but it's this. The other thing that happened is my right eye has been bothering me, like, either my painting glasses, or a film there, or something, I don't know what it is. And that got very hot. No, nothing we have. So it was like healing <laughs> like that. Okay, then, we're going to come back to circle. That was good. Mm -hmm. What do I say about you? It's okay. Oh, no, it's okay. Well, that was too good. So does anyone have any comments or questions coming out of that process? One of the things that I realized as I was going through the process is I've been working on the left side of my body. And all that came up was on the right side of my body. Uh, same places. And it is neck pain and shoulder pain where I hold stress. And then I realized going through this experience that I was trying to control someone else who had been very close to me, who rejected me. I didn't do anything wrong. I thought if I did X, they would accept me, but they didn't, because it wasn't about that. So as I let the separation go, the pain or the feeling in this side of my neck and my shoulder started to dissipate. There's also something with my eye, my right eye, which has been going on for a while, and either I need new glasses or I need to see something. I don't know which one it is, but I'll get my eyes checked out. But it was interesting because as that unfolded, then all these other people that had a significant, um, what I thought was control and telling me what to do issue, my issue, they kind of like 
broke apart because once she was the core, or what I called her the core, and she started to spread out and let go, and I realized the only person I really can control is me, and I don't even know if I can do that, but I certainly can't do it outside of me, other than through the white light. Not a control, but to touch through the white light. Um, that they're all separate, and they're all the same. That's what I got. So helpful, right? Mm hmm Very. Very surprising that it was on the other side. Any other? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry I have to go and return to work today, but um, I wanted to share the image that came. I, too, am working on the left side of the body. I've had a lot of pain issues, always on the left side, physically. And... Uh, so that was the side that seemed obscurated, and um, I saw Badra slicing through that darkness as I entered the field of light, and um, like ribbons, suddenly they were just ribbons. And then um, the diamond, the female energy uh, from the diamond realm when you spoke of, of filling the area with light I saw the left side of my body filled with diamonds mm -hmm. and sparkling and um, the thought of um, from this moment forth what I see in front of me will be filled with diamonds Mm. The world itself will be full of diamonds. That when I listen to people speak, I will hear their diamonds of their knowledge or wisdom or beauty or even their sadness. Um, and that when I touch the world, I will feel the diamonds and taste food will have that essence as well. And. Um, no, I guess too. It was in there. I don't remember that though. And um, it ended with the word now. And uh, I came here feeling that in recent months that I'm at a stage in my life where I feel like I'm not really sharing my inner self, my diamond, so to speak, uh, that uh, some part of me is never really giving the whole big picture. And I feel like now I have given myself permission or come to the understanding that this is it. This is, life is not a rehearsal. Put it out there. <laughs> so, um, that's going to be my goal for the rest of my life, to just put those diamonds out there and let all the world see. It's, we are all very beautiful, extraordinarily so. And we have this capacity to share this beauty, even the beauty of anger. And um, I sometimes refer to ugliness of per se, as a terrible beauty, because it is in itself who we are and what we are working through. So it also is, is beautiful. And to just put it all out there as much as you can every day, and the rest will take care of itself. So I honor everyone who's been here. Thank you. I, I have felt like there has been learning at every corner of this experience. I would sit down at dinner and someone put something out and it's beautiful. <laughs> and they come to the classes and meditations have been extraordinary. This, this stillness that I have been uncovering through yin yoga actually in the last year, I've come to understand an even deeper stillness here that is, it, it's like music in its own way. It's a stillness but it is a, it is a, sound or music at the same time that is 
really lovely. So I'm hoping to bring this into my work and into um, the healing work that I do at work, um, which doesn't ever feel like work. It's really a joy to work with people in, um, in medicine. And um, to continue the ripples in the, the ponds that, that are out there. So thank you all for bringing me so much while I was here. Thank you. And I want to thank you all, too. I also have to leave, but it's been a wonderful experience. And uh, this, what we just did, was a huge breakthrough that I've been working on my whole life. So now I can have a visualization of it. And when the fear comes up, put the white light or go into the white light and then transmute the fear. So. Thank you all very much. Anyone else have anything they'd like to share? Or questions they might have? Sure, I know. <laughs> it's interesting. Start with 20. <laughs> it feels strange sharing what I'm about to share after. Um, I, what, what happens when we I, I really couldn't access that space. Just keep trying. It's not unusual not to be able to access it. But you want to, there's actually this meditation or one that's similar to it is on uh, the website, Sacred Stream website, the Vajrasattva meditation. So you can continue. It's not exactly the same, it's never exactly the same um, meditation, but I would keep, keep, keep efforting. And um, if you find that you really can't do it, then I would recommend, of course, there's other ways of working, but the way that I know to work is to get in connection with the death hypnosis practitioner. And um, I mean, you've got this great connection with Simone. I would really, or I don't know if you feel it is a great connection, but you have this possibility of a great, <laughs> you have a possibility of a connection with Simone who has already helped you extensively. Um, and I would, I would recommend, you know, working on different levels conceptually, emotionally, energetically on, you know, what the obstacle might be. It's not unusual to not be able to move as deeply as you want to move into a field like this. Yeah. But you have to try in order to know where you are in relationship to it. Yeah. Usually I have no trouble at all, but yeah. Well, we're, we're going in through an obstacle, so. <laughs> that can be hard. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I was uh, adding the spirit guide to the deity visualization. It deeply personalized it. There was a looseness and creativity in the, in the experience I've never had before. Um, I mean, because I, I was taught the Rajasattva from very traditional sources, so I always took it so seriously. Like, am I visualizing the outfit right? Is the bar <laughs> in the right place? Or, you know, is the consort there? And the, the spirit guide, bring that in for some reason, let that all go. I mean, I, I was saying to Lorraine about this, that usually my mind would go to these very strange places like what's wrong with my day, and instead my mind was going to all these practices. It was a nice thing. You might want to like take a moment like to think about the way that your mind was going through those practices and see if there's more that you could like you know how this this opened up your practice, this particular thing opened up the Vajrasattva practice for you. Go through those practices, and you might even think about going with your guide through those practices to see what they what that does. This is exactly you're giving an exact experiential report on what I was talking about in terms of that that uh, the the use of the shamanic guide as a. Um, uh, a companion on the path that, that helps you be able to digest and access these larger principles. So that's a really, that's great. I'm so glad you had that experience. All right. Yeah. Uh, for me, the interesting thing was to, it took me time to settle there. Like, what's the color? Was the, oh, how am I sitting? Or, like, I was telling um, Annie, like it took me time to figure out the size of uh, Roger. So uh -huh. I, like first, it was the size of me, 
and I, I decided that was a he, but then I felt it's too small, then it became big. You know, it's like <laughs> it was a whole thing of figuring out my surroundings and how clear is that light or how white or, you know, it's just this, that was interesting. And then, you know, once I settled in there, you know, that, that took a bit of a time to figure out <laughs> the surroundings. Well, I mean, it's, again, you know, you're in a kind of new realm, right? Mm -hmm. So to, to try to, you know, figure out what your relationship is to it is yeah. important. Yeah. And, 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 you know, getting into the right configuration with the field is really important. So it's really good that you took that time. All right. Another question or comment? Um, Do you want to ask that spirit kind of question? Which which question? The I saw a bear in Yeah. Yeah. So, um, as Emily was in the journey, right? The other when day. When I came back to do the makeup journey, I saw a lot of things. Uh, one of them was a flash and the bear antlers. So, you've been asked. He's been asking me this question, like like when I'm like walking out the door or like <laughs> and I'm like just please bring it into circle um, so when you're working shamanically it's not first of all I would definitely recommend asking the bear with antlers if it's your guide we're gonna do another journey um, you can download the drumming off of our website so if you want to do that but the thing that I wanted to tell you in circle was that if you've ever heard of the concept of shape shifting and uh, guides will often take on different aspects in order to be able to, uh, different aspects of different animals, or they will change their aspect. And one of the reasons why this happens is because there's an effort on the part of the guidance that the, this coming through that image to give you more information about the nature of that guide or teacher. So for instance, a bear might mean something to you, but then a bear with antlers, what does that mean? You know, like, I, and I'm, I, could, I, don't, I could give you some examples of what it might mean, but I, wanted to, I don't want to do any suggestions. So think about how the addition of the antlers gives you more information about the guide than simply the bear. And that, that and the thing that you encountered is a very time-honored process that happens within shamanic practice that you may or may not have known anything about, which is this issue of shape-shifting. And um, I like to point out when this happens spontaneously in people's shamanic practice, because especially as we're heading into the practice at the beginning, it seems very foreign and unknown, and this is right, this is crazy. Um, but when you, when you start having experiences that are the same experiences that shamanic practitioners have had for millennia without necessarily understanding that you were having that experience, it's important to note it because it helps you understand where you are on the path and that you are on a path that, that is unique to you but has also had other practitioners um, having ex similar experiences and the other thing that I really like to, what that points to is the way, the very consistent way in which guides teach. And this is something that it's difficult to know at the beginning of the practice, but now that I've taught uh, thousands of people how to journey, the thing that I see is that the guides are extremely consistent in the way that they uh, approach, even though they may have a completely different reason for approaching or a different a different thing that they're teaching, they will come to you and they will have this very consistent way of bringing information and drawing you into your own knowing. So I just wanted to, so again, that simple image of the antler and the bear, think about what that means, how that deepens your understanding of what bear is, you know, what... I like it made the bear larger and Okay. Um, it was about being like it was about being much bigger than me. That's what I felt from it instantly. Okay. 
was that the bear was trying to show me that it was far bigger than I was, and it knew more, it was dominant, but I, I felt before I saw the bear, I saw a deer, a young female dog, drinking from a creek, and that ended up being what guided me into the clear light, which, the, which was what it was drinking. It was like, I don't know, I saw it. Well, the main thing when you see a lot of things is when, it, when you meet different guides within the journey, and this is the kind of thing that we go into in the shamanic journey class. You always ask, are you my guide? I uh, told totally. the deer was. But you need to ask. Oh, I asked. Yeah. I asked yeah. the deer. The deer yeah. said yes. I asked the bear, and the bear said no. And I said, what do you have to teach me? I said, everything has something to teach you. Okay, well, if, if someone says no, then we're done. You don't interact with them. Nothing, okay. they nothing to learn. Yeah, yeah, I mean, everything, it's true that you have something to learn, but if a guide says outright, there's nothing there. And then. Well, I didn't get that it was my teacher. Uh huh, okay. All not right. my, like, not my power animal or whatever okay. it was that I was looking for, but I was also trying to learn it myself. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a good idea at the beginning. You want to have a little bit of discipline. Okay. But it's fine to have more than one, but you should. Like, it's good to develop a strong relationship with one guy. So the issue around shape-shifting may not be as important as I've mentioned in this particular case, but the teaching is there nonetheless. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Sure. Did you have another question? I mean, I was, I was going to ask about deities. OK. Um, and Vajrasattva. Uh, uh, the things that you were explaining, she was holding, or he, the, the diamond and the cup, which I couldn't, I couldn't imagine. While this is Tara. This is Vajrasam. Oh, that was probably, it's probably yeah. part of my problem. Uh -huh. <laughs> I know, I think Bob thought we were working, uh, you know, uh, Bob kind of tuned into Tara because we work with Tara and the sacred feminine. So I think he was thinking Tara when he looked at that other image. and. So it's fine, we worked with Tara, no problem. But um, actually, Vajrasattva is that. How important is it to, to um, visualize the things? I, as, uh, the main thing that the, the visualization of the different implements that the deities use, the importance of that is what the implements are pointing to not the implements themselves. And one of the things that, you know, that you, I think it sounds like you've run into, Justin, is in the traditional methods of practicing deity meditation, there is so much emphasis on form, this particular thing, that particular way, and you get tripped up. I find I get tripped up trying to get everything just right, and I lose the capacity to be able to see or understand or feel what the implement or the aspect of the deity is actually pointing to. And this is not uncommon with tradition, and you find this not only in shamanic practice, not only in uh, Buddhist practice, but you find it also in shamanic practice, where you see like people who are trying to learn a particular ritual from a particular tradition, all they do is focus on, okay, so now the beater has to be here, and then the leaf has to be here, and then you know the, the cloth has to be placed in this way, and they don't even know why they're doing it. And they don't know what the beater means or what the plan means or what the cloth means. And then they will become strident and unpleasant when other people do it other ways. And then they're just defending a form that they have no understanding about what its meaning is. This is, you know, this is, and, and then, you know, they, you know, then this becomes a basis for division rather than a basis for knowledge and connection. And you find this a lot with shamanic cultures, and this is one of the basis for culture vulturism anyway. I, don't, I think this is why I like the idea of bringing forward your own rituals, making things alive for yourself, and asking your guides to give you your own way of being, rather than trying. I think that it has, I mean, definitely there are value, there is value to following a path that other people have taken to knowledge. Clearly, there is a value to that. But when the path becomes only the configurations on the path and not the path itself, the, the things that indicate that the path is here rather than the path itself, then you begin to move into this kind of dull orthodoxy 
that can happen even in, in situations where there is an intention for in, in, toward enlightenment. And um, this is, you know, I'm actually very ferocious about defending people's right to their own Gnostic experience. And, um, and you know, the reason that orthodoxies actually reject this kind of thing is because they're afraid that people will take the wrong path or that they will fall into delusion. And I understand that and I, I, I recognize that that is true. But there is a way of being with um, one's own self and one's own path in the discovery of uh, one's own path and one's own self that can be mediated again with the proper relationship to the guide or to the deity. And, and again, you do need an external teacher, especially at the beginning, to keep you from falling into a delusory kind of relationship or experience uh, with the deity or with the, with the um, guide in the shamanic practice. But, and this is why I like to have people do a series of journeys with me before they go out on their own, because there is discipline that is needed um, to be able to uh, walk this path uh, effectively. And just because there is the possibility for one's own confusion or one's own obscurations to throw you, quote unquote, off the path, and that's why an orthodox person would say you have to have this particular stricture, this particular, this particular rule, is an effort to keep people off the path, or keep the people from falling off the path. I don't think those rules and those strictures actually work because what then happens is everyone develops a relationship to the rule or the stricture, and they don't ever see the path. So you have to you have to have a process where you find you know what kind you know if if you are falling into obscuration, then you've got the guide there, you've got the teacher here, to help you understand, okay, let's see what we can do about changing this obscuration or changing this issue. And you've already identified that you have a too active mind. And there's a lot that you have to do to discipline your mind. And mm -hmm. you found that in the meditation. You couldn't settle. And then you're finding it in the journey where you're doing all this kind of going around. So that's really helpful in helping you. I don't know if you agree with this Diagnosis. I don't. I, 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 I do uh, when it comes to trying to contact deities. My practice has been um, with my, my mom's, my God. And it happens in flash and I don't have to meditate. She's always here. Always inside me whenever I need her. I ask a question, it's answered in plain English. And I have honed intuition and overcome panic and all these things. But doing this traditionally, which is why I came here. Is a, is a brand new thing to chew. Yeah. So it's something I'm nowhere near practiced at. Yeah. And I fear getting involved with deities my whole life, honestly. Well, and, I mean, and there, you know, and I think that there, there is a way to walk the path, you know, and, and we can't find it. Um, but it, there's not just one way, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, I, I know that um, the way that I work with the daily meditation is out, way outside the orthodoxy, but I think, I think people really uh, learn quite a bit about what the deities are pointing to through the, through the meditations that I do, I, I think. I mean, I may be deluded myself, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned um, when we are following this path or doing the journeys or going back to the places that we discovered, that there are certain, there could be certain problems or dangers for falling off this path and taking, what are some of the precautions we can take? Stay close to the guide and mm -hmm. stay close to your own issues. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> One of the things that people do, they tend to get grandiose. Like, oh, now I know all about, <laughs> right? You know, and that's why I really love mm -hmm. staying close to the problem because the problem is grounding mm -hmm. and the problem will be the guide. Mm -hmm. And the way that the guide interacts with you around the problem will be the place where the teachings come, mm -hmm. which is kind of what we were doing today. And, and the possible dangers of 
falling off this path or the uh, bag? Well, the, it's, it, well the, the danger of falling off your own path, like with, you know, when I meant the path, I meant your path through life, mm -hmm. the danger of, of not following your own path is, is unhappiness mm -hmm. and lack of fulfillment mm -hmm. and, and frustration. Mm -hmm. And those are, those are very easy signals to pick up. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so then you can find your way back. Mm -hmm. right. I have a question about sleep. Is that okay to ask? Uh, we'll let you ask it. We'll see if it's right um, for this time. Yeah, so uh, this has been happening off and on, and last night was one of the times where I fall asleep with like my thought, like tremendous anxiety. And I will wake up, and it's like I'll wake up. And it's like my thoughts keep going. Like I'm wondering if there are rituals or things that I can do okay. to, to try. And yeah, and I'll wake up in the middle of the night multiple times, and in the morning I'll wake up like my brain is still running. Well, we're getting ready to do a, a journey to ask for a ritual to help with the removal of obstacles on a regular basis. So you're going to have your answer very shortly. Uh, I just wanted to say about Fajr Safa that I really appreciate uh, the context in which I learned that mantra was um, doing a deity meditation with um, Amitayas mm -hmm. and it's sort of uh, at the <coughs> end you add this to correct everything that you did wrong, you know, so that like you can connect with Amitabha because you the you might not be able to do it if you've done all these things wrong. You misspoke when you were reciting the mantra, or do, you know. So then, at the end, you're correcting it with the vajrasattva. <laughs> so, I came into this even the, with the way that you teach it, which is completely different. Sort of this idea that I've got to fix everything that I've done wrong, right? And like this is how I'm gonna like be able to fix myself so that I can actually connect with something. But it. And it's really just a subtle difference, but it makes all the difference in the world to be able to look at it like, well, no, there's, I'm not connected because there's an obscuration, and it might actually be the idea that I have to fix something. Right, right, right. right, right. So um, it's just really helpful. I find it really helpful to think about it in terms of, like, how do I connect with this deeper field that is helpful to me, and like, what obscurations do I have from doing that, as opposed to this, like, fix it now kind of approach. Right, right. So thank you. Yeah, no, I'm glad that's helpful. It's great. Okay, let's go ahead and have a quick bathroom break and then we're going to do a journey. of someone who's running it who may not be in total alignment with sure. power. And I have never met anyone in any tradition who was in alignment with power in the way that I thought they needed to be in order to run a sweat lodge. That most of the people that I've seen running sweat lodges are there to prey on the vulnerability of the people. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true with every situation. I've done a lot of sweat lodges and I actually I won't do them anymore because I haven't because, because there seems to be something, if there's some, there's some corruption in that line, that line of work. It's like a lot of Taoist stuff. It's got that same corruption where you've got people that are seeking power, like in this fantastic, beautiful tradition. You've got these people that are inappropriately seeking power. And everyone makes themselves vulnerable and then they lose their power and then they don't have any power unless they have the connection to the teacher. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I find that I find that reprehensible. Actually. What what is this what, like? What happens in this one? Like, um, I, 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 I
so Well, I don't know. I've never done a commercials, quote unquote. I mean, a lot of Lakota, you know, it's all it borders on commercial, but it's not actually commercial. Mm -hmm. But um, um, go ahead, you answer the question. I have so the Swat Lodge is like a small hut, mm -hmm. you know, built out of just tied sticks together and covered with heavy blankets. And you have a fire with bring up where you build a mound of rocks and you build a fire around it get the rocks up to pretty much red hot yeah. and then you bring the rocks in to the lodge and everyone and you pack a lot of the people and then you close the door and you sit in complete darkness and pour water on the rocks and it heats it up um, usually a fair bit past any sauna that yeah. you would ever be in and it uh, yeah, I'm it, kind of I'm guessing that it's just, I don't know what happens around that, like, is there a ritual around it? Or? So yeah, it's definitely a Native American ritual. Um, and it's based on praying. Mm -hmm. Praying for something or for somebody. Mm -hmm. Personally, I find it good for bringing up emotions that normally are not in day to day existence. Stuff, it really pushes you, you know, being in a small lodge, it feels like you're in a cage, kind of, because it's dark, it's dark and be, and then you have absolutely ragingly burning hot rocks in front of you, and you're packed in there, and it's like, the anxiety you have comes up quite vividly, so it's... Is it like an out, like, to speak out loud, or is it something... Sometimes. To, and there's somebody running? Yeah, yeah, there's uh, usually someone who's been part of the culture for a long time. We have a local guy who's uh, Navajo that does ours. I mean, I'm sure there's situations where it is a positive experience, but I, it's very artificial. And you're yeah. in there with everyone else's issues pouring yes. out, and so, how, and you're very vulnerable and open and porous, and who's mediating that and how are they mediating that? Do you see your point, too, because it, I mean, like I felt that too of going in with other people's issues and like being resistant to that. Yeah. And then, then you're made I, wrong for not being made for not being wanting to, be, wanting to be vulnerable. Right, right. I've had that feeling sometimes. Don't get me so it's like <laughs> <laughs> So there's two sides to it. It's like go in and push yourself or not. And I've had that Why? Feeling, Why? That strong feeling. Why should you push yourself into being exposed to other people's issues in an unmediated way. We all have this problem already. We all are traumatized by the fact that we don't have integral boundaries between people. Why go in and traumatize yourself and do what? Learn what? Right? I'm sorry. Oh, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I have, I mean, like when it comes into like I'm like, like I'm very like very open minded and like I think we should explore every possible path to 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 spirit and to self knowledge and you know very eclectic you know and you know draw from many traditions but I I, I have a rigidity in me when I feel that people are abusing power in whatever tradition they are or where there's delusion that's being codified. And then everybody is supposed to adhere to that delusion. So you're just basically creating more samsara rather than liberating people from that samsara. Mm -hmm. I've got an issue with anything when that happens, and I, I, I get a little testy. <laughs> 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 All right. So let's do a journey. So as I said, with the shamanic journey, um, there are many, many questions that one can ask of the guide once one has established a relationship with the guide. And the question that we're going to ask in this particular journey is you're going to ask for a ritual that you can do on a regular basis that will help you continue the process of purification that you just started and help you with other any other kind of obstacle that might come up. So a ritual of preparation that will bring forward 
the, the power that you need to help remove or help you remove any kind of obstacle or um, difficulty or conundrum that may come up. So again, remember we talked about the power of ritual and the way that ritual is designed to bring the power of the unseen into the world of the seen and that the different aspects of the ritual become a pathway for that power to move of the unseen, to move into the realm of the seen. So we've had, we've had a lot of teachings about the nature of ritual, and we've also had teachings about the nature of initiation, and how when you have an old form that falls away, you have a new form that can emerge. And what we want to do with this process of purification or a uh, process of clearing is to be able to manage and mediate and participate in our and manage our own initiatory process where we are allowing an old form to fall away, taking the power that's released from that and dedicating it to a new form that holds greater power, greater clarity, greater understanding, greater awareness. So this, this ritual that you're going to be doing is going to help you manage your own initiation process with the help of your shamanic guide and with the help of Vajrasattva. So because you understand better the nature of one way of doing purification or clearing processes through the deity meditation that we did with Vajrasattva. So it, the guide will show you with all of the understandings that you have had this weekend, how to incorporate those understandings into managing your own process of clearing any obscuration within you of, on any level, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, or physically, so that you can gain, gain greater insight and be able to dedicate the power that's released as those old forms of the obscuration fall away to a new way of being. Okay, that's what we're doing. So you're asking your guide for a um, ritual that you can do on a regular basis to help you with the process of clearing any obscuration that might impede your understanding of awareness and consciousness so that you can receive the assistance that you need to continue on your path of moving into greater consciousness. Okay? And this ritual could be a simple thing. It could be that you go at, the, at sunrise, you go and watch the sun. It could be that you go to the river and you perform certain processes with the stones and the sticks there. It could be that you do a certain prayer, or it could be that you do a certain meditation, or it could be that you do a song or a dance. This ritual could be anything. So just allow yourself to uh, receive that information and uh, allow yourself to uh, uh, pay attention to how the guide is offering you information. So what you're going to do with this journey is you are going to leave from the same place that you left from um, in the first journey. And in your journey practice, not that you, um, in your journey practice, you will always leave from this same place. You will always go to along the same path that you took to meet your guide. Um, whenever you are going to meet your guide in non-ordinary reality. And you remember, wherever you get to, wherever the guide has taken you, <clears throat> after you've asked this question <clears throat> and received this answer, you're going to come back exactly the way that you came when you hear the callback. And the callback is the change in the rhythm of the drumming. Okay? In the, Okay, so I'll go over the method again. You're going to keep your attention focused as you go to the place where you went, where you left from in the last journey. That hole in the ground, that body of water, that cavern, or that um, uh, 
hole in the tree and you're going to keep your attention down. I'm going to the lower world to meet my guide in animal form in order to ask for a ritual of purification. You keep your attention focused, you stop going down, you move to the same place or you ask the teacher to come to you where you met the teacher last time. Then you ask, can you offer me a ritual of purification that I can do on a regular basis? Then you pay close attention to everything that the teacher shows you and then you um, when you hear the change in the rhythm of the drum, wherever you've gotten to, you turn around and you come back exactly the way that you came. So by the end of the second set of drummings, you're back in the room remembering everything. Okay? And as you're doing this, remembering also everything that Vajrasattva has shown you about purification.
take your time coming back into the room. And go ahead and reflect on your experience. And I would recommend writing it down if you can, because it will help you remember it as you do this on a regular basis.
anyone have any questions or this is a ritual that you'll be doing on a regular basis and you know when you find yourself with a hard time or you know trying to understand something it's it's something that you can engage in to request help from the unseen coming into the world of the scene um, and um, I'd like to see if anyone has any questions or comments about it so right before we go into the journey I was given the same information I received in the journey literally before I even shut my eyes or lay down I had the feeling instantaneously of what that was going to be in my way and that my ritual was make tea preferably not caffeinated tea not green tea and uh, be more mindful of what I put in my body um, but I'm curious if, if you think that I am guiding my own I'm predetermining what my journey is going to be or if that's what my journey would have been and I just happen to be Are you asking me to give you a diagnosis of what I think is going on? I'm with you? curious. <laughs> I think that, that I would be, I would even be, because when I when I went through the journey, it wasn't um, a lot of it was just relaxing. Yeah. Well, you know, I'll give you a simple answer. Um, um, some people are more natural channelers and some people are more natural journeyers. And when you channel, basically what you're doing is you're drawing the power of the unseen in through your system and focusing it on an issue. Right? When you're journeying, you're going into non-ordinary reality and you're asking a question about something that's happening in ordinary reality. Right? So some people are more, nat more naturally drawn one way, draw power from the unseen into their issues, and some prefer to go into the unseen to look at their issues. The task is the same with either, is to get clarity about your purpose and discipline with your practice, and to do everything you can to remove any kinds of attachments or aversions or uh, wrong knowings about the way that you're engaging with issues. So it could be that you're a natural channeler, but I would still think it's useful to, like if a lot of, anyway, there's a really long, 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 long place that I could go, but I'm not sure it's the right thing. So let me just stop there. That's I, cha I channel a lot. There's something to learn. I mean, it's fine that you did that um, because we're not officially teaching you journeying, you know. You know, but if we were in a journey class, I would be all over you. Okay. Okay. But 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 the thing is, I'm glad. That's great that you took it yeah. upon yourself to find something that is right. Yeah. But one thing that I would do if we were in a regular journey class is ask you to look at all the reasons what felt wrong. Yeah. Like we would go into that in a regular journey. So at some point, yeah. go into all that wrong feeling. I okay. will. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, well, so I entered through the, through the Ganges at RMRC, and, and I haven't been there for a long time. Mm -hmm. not long ago. Okay. And then I spiraled down very quickly, but sort of playfully, like Alice. And then I met a fox, and I asked if it was my Died and it, it was sort of clearly playful, but sort of like, no, I'm not. But then it ran, and I followed it, and it was across a field, a starlit field, and then into a forest. And then there was a witch that tried to grab my shoulder, and I sort of shrugged her off. And then I saw the flash of the whale's eye and tried to go after 
and I met him, and I, and I was sort of desperate, like, are, are you? And then he nodded yes and then shrunk to my size. So it was like a very small whale <laughs> in some sort of water. And then there were can and then I asked to be shown the ritual, and there were candles all around him, and his fins were in prayer. And so there were just can and then um, and then he was sort of playful and and then there was an image of water swirling, like water that I was supposed to somehow swirl water or turn water. And then an elephant appeared and I asked if he was a guy. But then he took me into his trunk, like I was like it was a hammock, and then across a body of water in a boat. And then he said, you will be held like this again. And then he flung me into space. And that's when it ended. OK, so if this was a regular journey class, the thing that I teach is that you ask one question for one journey, right? And I gave you the instruction. Again, I, you know, there's a lot that can be gained here. But one of the reasons why you're confused is because you didn't stay with the question. And um, this is this is when we're talking about charting a path through confusion or delusion or anything like that. One of the and discipline is one of the ways that you do that. So you hold on. So so there's very little that I actually you know I know you know like you see me like in the beginning of the day like making sure everything is right in the circle and you know you like that. But I'm really a very loosey goosey kind of person. But there are. But there, but, but there are places where you have to hold form and discipline in order to be able to chart the unknown effectively, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, it was great that you had the discipline to ask the fox if it was your guide and that you were able to perceive that it wasn't. It was great that you were able to have the discipline to ask your whale if it was your guide and that you realized that it was. And then it gave you the information that, did you ever ask for the ritual? Yes. Okay. And that's when the candles appeared. Okay. So good. So then you remembered, you had your discipline, and you asked your question. You did what you came for, mm -hmm. right? Then you had the, the, the whale actually gave you the ritual. You light candles all around you, you pray, and you swirl water in a dish, or I don't know exactly how. Mm -hmm. that's, that's your ritual, okay? So then, you had this experience with the whale and the boat, and what I, 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 I'm not, when, whenever you have things that are happening in a journey that you're not sure of, you always go back and you ask, how is this related to the question? Mm -hmm. So, I'm not sure, you know, what question, what answer you would get there. But um, if, and I don't want you to feel like you did anything wrong, absolutely not. But you can see how it might have been more clear if you had gone to the guy, if you'd left, I mean, I'm really glad that you found this place that feels good for you. But if you go, leave from the same place, go to the same guy, ask the one question, and that's it. Yeah. Right. You can see how that would be more more clear, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that what happened for you is not valid and valuable and that everything that you did is not going to lead you someplace important. But what I would recommend doing then in a further journey is to go to the elephant, confirm that it's your guide, ask what it was trying to show you in terms of the way that you're being held and what does that mean. Mm -hmm. So then that's the way you follow that up. So then it doesn't become this kind of willy-nilly thing, right? You, you, you bring, and you, you just ask that one question in the journey. I really recommend taking the journey class with me, yeah. next, if you can, on the phone. Because, um, I, you know, I think, you'll, I think with a little bit of discipline, you're going to be able to chart your way through this kind of internal disorganization that's, that's tormenting you. Is that helpful? Okay. Any other questions or comments? Mm -hmm. My questions. 
I sometimes like I'm not that I do this often, but in two times I've done this. Um, there comes this feeling of weird anxiety that I will soon have to get out of there. Because when you change the rhythm, like I'll have to head out and I'll have to make my way out the same way I came. So it kind of creates a strange um, strange thing that uh, doesn't let me completely relax after a while. Like when I know that it's time, it's close to the time that I will need to get out so that I don't find myself rushing back. <laughs> is, is, I mean, does, does it matter or is it like, do you really need to, like, I don't know, my, the way my mind works, I guess, is that I visually have to, and, and like feeling-wise, I have to make that same you know, way as I can. Well, <laughs> it could be that you just need a longer journey. I think, I think, because these are relatively short journeys on the download or on the CD um, that you can get on the website. Mm -hmm. There's 10 minute, 15 minute, 30 minute journeys. It may ju you may just need to feel like you have more space and like, and if you know that it's the presence of 30 minute journey, then you can just relax, mm -hmm. right? That could, it, would that be helpful? Would that be an antidote or not? I guess so. Just maybe not. Even even in, in there, it could help. But like it, it's just this. This anxiety of having to make that way out and being ready to get out of there. Like, it's not that important, it's just that what if, let's say, you make that way out like in a much faster way? Oh, that's fine. And you spend your time there a little longer, and then maybe you just end up where you came from, not really making the way. Well, as long as you, I mean, you'll see, you know, at the beginning, again, I ask you to do you know, go take step by step back. Mm -hmm. But as, and this can happen even right at the beginning, as long as you're kind of, kind of zooming by everywhere where you went, that is helpful. And the reason for this is only so that you don't get lost in non-ordinary reality, so that you have a path that you can always, that you know you can always find your way back. And also so that you can review everything that you learned in the journey because sometimes you can have a lot of things that you experience in the journey and by going back the way that you came you're simply reviewing mm -hmm. and it's kind of so those are the two reasons for it and but um, and so you could do that quickly or or and as long as those two things are happening nothing else really matters but I teach that in that particular form in order to develop that discipline but if you can attain that discipline in another way, it's no problem. And um, the other thing that I would say, again, if this was a regular journey class, I, I would look into this issue of this feeling like you have to be responsive to, like, like you have to do, I, I mean, I, when you're talking about it, it feels like there's this thing looming that you have to address and that you have to do right. Do you have that experience in general in your life? Like, do you? I guess so. so. So then I would really go into that because it feels like one of the things that comes up as you do your journey practice is you, your own internal configurations that you might not have even recognized before come forward for clarification. So if, if you're walking around in the world with this feeling, oh, but there's this, this duty or this responsibility or this thing that I have to do right and I have to make sure that I do it right, it would be really important to look at where that comes from and what effect it has on you. And what we would do in a journey practice is ask, what are the origins of this experience? Mm -hmm. And that, that can be very enlightening and you might want to do that. And then, then what effect does this have on my life? And that can be very enlightening. And once you have all the information that you feel that you need around the pattern, then you can ask, how could I be with the experience of duty or responsibility or task creation differently? Mm -hmm. So then you've unwound a little karmic pattern. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Okay. All right, any other question or comment? Okay, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to go over everything that we've covered.
I can't, I cannot repeat everything the boss said. <laughs> but um, I would like to just kind of review everything that we've learned um, here after we've had the experience to see if you hear or understand anything slightly differently. Um, so, um, So, we started out by looking at the similarities and the differences between the two paths, of shamans and siddhas. And um, we discussed the, the shamanic path as being a path of investigating non-ordinary reality that is um, primarily focused on understanding the power of the earth and bringing that wisdom and power into the affairs of people. And this is the, the shaman's primary uh, duty or task to the group that the shaman serves. And then uh, we looked at the, the wisdom system of the Siddha. And we looked at it in several different ways, but one of the important differences is that the, the primary task of the Siddha is to develop the Siddha's own consciousness and awareness and to um, investigate the larger universal experience beyond simply the, the power of the earth. Although, of course, ultimately they all come together, but there's a differentiation in form. So, um, so then it's the, the similarities that they both share are that they both traditions focus on the movement of energy and power from one place to another. Both use the process of ritual to direct that power from one place to another. Both use the process of initiation to create a ladder for skill development. And both work with elements, light, and sound as a basis for accessing deeper understanding. And you, you've had that experience with the mantras of the sound generating sound, right? The, the general differences are that shamanic practice is more service oriented to the community. Siddha practice is more oriented toward individual liberation. Shamanic uh, understandings view the movement of power and energy as outside of the self. So you have this experience of the guide as outside of the self, generally. And Siddha practice views the movement of power and energy as arising from within the self. There's this, this uh, investigation into one's own experience as a vehicle of knowledge. Shamanic practice focuses on the middle world or on mundane events, the, 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 the world of uh, ordinary reality. Siddha practice focuses on supra-mundane events, things that are beyond ordinary reality. Shamanic practice has primary focus on understanding the power of the natural world. We talked about that. And Siddha practice has primary focus on understanding the power of universal flow and luminosity. Anyone have any questions now that you've gone through the material? Anyone have any questions on, on that? Did you? Okay. And then we looked at rituals, and we understood about how rituals are pathways for that power to come from non-ordinary reality to ordinary reality. And we understood how they are important carriers and containers of experience, and that it's very important to consider what kinds of rituals you are doing and what kind of power or energy you are evoking with them. And we also talked about how important it is to keep your own experience of ritual alive and to be careful about what kind of ritual you are actually participating in. Is this something that brings you closer to yourself or further away from yourself? And then we focused on the nature of initiation. We talked about how initiations are intimately tied with change, how they bring the initiate into a new state of being, the way that they do this is by challenging the status quo. 
and the way that the challenge is met determines the initiate's experience of the initiation and the initiation, the initiate's experience of initiation determines what kinds of lessons or purifications the initiate needs to undergo in order to be able to move to the next level of consciousness. So we, we had all those teachings around initiation, and we focused those teachings into the purification rituals of Vajrasattva. And, um, and the initiation that come, excuse me, the purification initiations of Vajrasattva and the initiations that come out of that. Then, of course, what we also focused on is on the two primary vehicles for <coughs> transforming consciousness in each of the traditions. One is through the shamanic journey on the shamanic path, and you had the experience of working with the drum and contacting the guide and asking a question of the guide. And then we had the experience of uh, doing the deity meditation, where you move into the field of the deity and you practice aligning yourself with the field of the deity. We did that with the um, with, by entering into the clear light, establishing ground in the clear light with the help of the guide, and then aligning with Vajrasattva in that the way that the Vajrasattva is in that Vajra position, getting that kind of stable, um, unperturbable connection with the clear light, and then feeling, sensing, and allowing the form of Vajrasattva to emerge from that field to give the instructions on the purification and to offer assistance on the issue that need purification. Now, um, this particular deity, of course, is about purification. If you were working with other deities um, that hold different types of power, for instance, with Tara, if you, there's, there's another way, I mean, there are many ways to do deity meditation. Um, and I, I think that it might be an idea, since we have some time, to do another form of deity meditation. Um, if, uh, if you want to, we'll go where you want to go. Um, but there's another way of drawing the deity into your energy system um, and allowing the deity to teach you. And I think actually, why don't we go ahead and do that? Because I think I think it would be informative to you, and it would, I think it would ground the discussion of White Tara that we've been engaged with, with Bob, because Bob was so focused there. Um, let's go ahead and do that last meditation, um, and 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 um, but just to finish the learning, um, you know, where you you basically merge with the field of the deity in order to. Uh, make inquiry and have uh, learnings about the field of experience that the deity mediates, right? So that's what we've covered. <laughs> Anyone have any questions about everything, anything we've covered? All right, well, let's do our bonus meditation. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to go over again the qualities of White Tara that Bob went over. Um, and um, you'll remember um, that um, Tara is uh, in her um, white form. She is the, she is the um, deity that helps um, extend life, deepen longevity, um, and of course, all the Taras offer assistance. And um, they are all engaged in some way with, with helping develop understanding about different aspects of experience. The white Tara is generally uh, focused on longevity practices. Now, let's talk about longevity and what longevity is. Um, so. You know, it's not just extending your life. It's about sustaining yourself on the path. You know, what is needed in order to sustain yourself and be able to have 
uh, unbroken, not exactly permanent, not exactly unchanging, but stable and and not exactly stable, but um, unbroken is probably the best way to describe this. How to have an un how to how to, over the long term to have an unbroken, flexible, yet unbreakable connection with yourself and with the universal power with the universal field. You know how how do you sustain in that? Because this is the issue, right? How you know how how do we attain a sense of awareness of our own longevity that, that Bob was talking about in different terms, you know, this kind of infinite life idea. How, how do we attain that, that, that way of being where, and how do we develop the capacity to be able to stay connected in an unbroken way to our own divinity and into the, or not necessarily divinity, our own Buddha nature and the way in which that Buddha nature is connected to all of the universal field. So when you think about longevity in that sense, it's really different than how do I do this practice so that I live a long time on a physical plane, right? You see that difference, right? So let's go ahead and just focus on this idea as we're doing the meditation. But there may be other teachings that White Tara has to offer you as well. These are just the primary teachings that she's known for. So I'm going to go ahead and take you in uh, to the meditation. And just allow any other teachings to emerge from the daily meditation as well. Just allowing yourself to get settled. Noticing all the places where the surface under you meets the different parts of your body. And as you do, just noticing where your breath is. Watching your breath as it moves in and watching your breath as it moves out. Just allowing yourself now, as you feel yourself stabilizing in your breath, to sense or feel or imagine a ball of clear light at the top of your head. And just allowing yourself, as you sense or feel or imagine this ball of clear light, to begin to breathe into the center of it, and as you breathe out, breathe out from the center of it. Just continue letting your breath move back and forth in this way. ready 
just allowing yourself to sense or feel or imagine another ball of light at your chest and throat, a ball of clear light at your chest and throat, breathing in to this ball of light and breathing out. And then when you're ready, just imagining or sensing or feeling <clears throat> that there's another ball of light at your, at your belly, the bottom of your belly. Ball of clear light here at your belly. Just bringing your breath in to that ball of clear light at your belly and breathing out. Just sensing or feeling or imagining another ball of clear light here at your belly, breathing into the center of it and breathing out. And as you become aware of these three balls of light here, the one at the ball of clear light at the top of your head, the ball of light of clear light at your chest, and the ball of clear light at your belly, just becoming aware of all three at once. And when you're ready, just breathing into the ball of clear light at the top of your head one more time. And as you breathe out, bring that ball of clear light down to the ball of clear light at your chest and throat. So that the two balls of clear light are one here in your chest and throat. So breathing into the ball of clear light at the top of your head. And as you breathe out, draw that ball of light down through the center of your body to the ball of light at your chest and throat. And then when you're ready, breathing into the ball of light at your chest and throat. And as you breathe out, Draw that ball of clear light that contains both balls of light now into the ball of light at your belly. So as you breathe in, breathe into the ball of light at your chest and throat. And as you breathe out, draw it down through the center of your body into the ball of light at your belly.
and just noticing how you have opened what is called the central channel, this energetic structure that more or less follows the spine, the center of your body, as you've brought down these balls of light from your head to your chest to your belly. You've created a, the opening in the central channel and just allowing yourself now to take a moment and breathe into the ball of light at your belly. And as you breathe out, as you breathe in, breathe into the ball of light at your belly. And as you breathe out, bring your breath up the central channel. Breathe in as you get to the top of your head and bring your breath down through the central channel. Just feeling the way in which your central channel is coated with clear light as you breathe from the bottom of your central channel, from the ball of light at your belly, up to the top of your head where the first ball of light was. And as you breathe back down, lining, coating the central channel with clear light. As you feel your central channel opened and protected by the clear light, allow yourself now to sense or feel or imagine another ball of clear light at the top of your head that contains the image of White Tara, that contains White Tara herself. And just allowing yourself to remember the nature of White Tara she herself is made of clear light in, in its purity. She has her hands, one of her hands in the earth touching mudra with the eyeball in the center of her palm indicating that she sees and understands all experience on the earth. And in the other hand, she holds the plant that cures all ills. She's seated in the Vajra posture. Unperturbable, unshakable in her connection with the clear light. And in her crown, she has Amitabha. the Buddha of infinite light. And she's seated on a lotus. The sun and the moon are above her, indicating her mastery of duality. Allow yourself to Sense white Tara here and this ball of light at the top of your head. And when you're ready, just breathing into this ball of light that has Tara in it. And as you breathe out, draw the ball of light with Tara in it down through your head, down through your throat, down through your chest, through the central channel coming down, bringing your breath all the way down to the ball of light at your belly, drawing the ball of light that holds Tara so that she is now in that ball of light at your belly, just feeling the power of Tara here in your belly, breathing in to the ball of light that holds white Tara and breathing out. And keeping your attention focused, breathing in and breathing out. Keeping your attention focused on your breath and its connection with white Tara 
and just allow yourself now, as you hold with that attention, to let White Tara teach you about the nature of longevity, the nature of time, the nature of endurance and sustainability. Wonders come back to breathing in your belly, breathing into the ball of light that's holding white Tara, refocusing on her nature, her teachings on longevity, endurance, stability, unbroken connection to the Buddha nature, to the universal field. her teach you what you might need to learn specifically because of your relationship to this issue of longevity and time. Just summarizing what you've learned from this experience. And then when you're ready, just breathing into the ball of light that holds Tara. And as you breathe out, draw that ball of light up through your central channel, up through your chest, through your throat, through your head, so that that ball of light is at the top of your head with Tara in it. And then go ahead and breathe into that ball of light and dissolve the image of Tara as you breathe out. And then breathing into the balls of light that are here at your belly, the three balls of light that were at your head, your chest, and your belly that are all here in your belly now, these three balls of clear light. 
draw in, draw your breath into the center of this ball of light that contains all three. And as you breathe out, draw all three balls of light up through your central channel, up through your chest, your throat, and your head. And imagine or sense or feel that you are closing the central channel behind the clear light, behind the balls of clear light as they move up into the top of your head. And then breathing into the balls of clear light here at the top of your head and just dissolving them as you breathe out. Feeling your central channel to be closed. Asking for assistance from White Tara if you need help closing your central channel. And then just returning to your breath. Watching your breath move in, and watching your breath move out. Resting in your breath, reviewing what you've learned. And then when you're ready, just allow yourself now to feel the surface under you. Stretching a bit. And whenever you're ready, just taking all the time that you need to come back into the room. And just review your meditation or write down what you've learned. Does anyone have any questions or comments about that, that method of daily meditation? Or does anyone have anything they want to ask about or comment on, on the teachings of White Tara? So I've always felt uncomfortable with deities until now. I'm open to it now. But I'm curious uh, about just general Buddhism question. Buddha reached enlightenment. Did he have the help of deities doing it? Um, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't intentional. Because his intent, as far as I understood it, his intention was to, he wanted to get away from any potential corruption 
There's a lot. There's a lot of a lot of uh, there's a, a lot of different deities and a lot of different traditions that have a lot of different intentionality around them, and so you you do have to be very careful. You know what kind of you know it's the same as 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 working with shamanic guides. You have to be very careful about what you're interacting with and what your intentionality is and what the intentionality of that which you're interacting. with. Do you have something you want to say to me? Yeah, well, it's just a, a, a block for you to bring to the two traditions um, in reference to the uh, magical and miraculous side of it. With the, the Siddha path, it's, they talk about developing the Siddhas, the actual ma the magical powers of telepathy, bilocation, all these miraculous things. Um, and also, it, that it seems the magical and the miraculous is also embraced in shamanism, but in the Buddhist tradition, you're not supposed to, that's supposed to be kept close to your sleeve. But with shamanism, it seems it's almost used as a way to entice. And I've just never been able to reconcile with the two that it almost seems that the shaman uses the miraculous to be spectacle and shouldn't. Well, you see a lot of shamans doing the shaman show. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and that's what a lot of shamans are doing, is the shaman show. They're, they're demonstrating their capacity rather than actually having the intention to offer something positive. So, and you find there's a, there a lot of degeneration in shamanic practice. It's one of the reasons why I don't like teaching straight ahead shamanism, because there is so much degeneration. Because what happens is people get confused between what is the universal power and what is their personal power. And so when they're doing things like, you know, a drum healing or something, they're, they're more interested in showing you how powerful they can be over you rather than showing you how they can be a conduit for the universal assistance that can offer you help. Right. Does that help you? Yeah. In relation to that, that uh, it feels like as long as it's selfless, the power is, the, the, the entire point of being a shaman is to heal community. So do you agree about the Buddhist tradition that Ma says they will reveal miracles? And, but it seems like you were saying earlier, it's a case-by-case -case basis. And, you know, yeah, I mean, I think that you know, there's wizardry in both. Maybe I should put that as one of the similarities, that there's yeah. wizardry in both. Um, and again, it's the individual. Wizardry meaning the, the capacity to be able to direct elements, sound, and light in the place where you want to or are called to in order to affect change. So that's what, you know, I was talking about directing elements, sound and light, but that wizard, I should actually call it probably wizardry. It might be confusing for people because there's this idea of wizards. That's, that's well, it seems like old traditions use the, um, the theater of the tricks of the magician to hint towards the miraculous. It's just interesting to see how each tradition does it. It seems that Shamanism is much more of a show traditionally, but with Buddhism, it's also also a lot more dramatic too. And it does happen, it seems. Well, I see think that thousands of people see a, a Tara or. You know. Right, but 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 the shaman is not necessarily pointing toward the miraculous. Mm -hmm. The shaman is using the powers of the elements and light and sound generally to heal. They're not trying to demonstrate that you don't usually have that intentionality of it, trying to demonstrate this like big universal field with all of its magic to people as a vehicle of transforming consciousness. 
general, generally speaking. Shamans, shamans, are, you, shamans are like craftspeople. They're making good, strong pottery, you know, like that you can work with every day. And I think Sean, I think Siddhas might like do porcelain with diggly glues on it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I, um, it's, it's my experience. Of course, everyone might have a different experience, idea, but this is my idea. Um, that the whole experience of magic and the movement of elements and sound and light um, is common to both. But um, I, I really do think that shamans are, are generally thinking about how are they going to apply this to everyday reality. And siddhas are, are thinking about how, how, how is this going to open awareness to the universal field. And the, and the big divide being Shamans want to do that for the sake of the community. Well, generally, they're, they're, that's what their purpose is, is to work for the community. And I think Siddhas also want to work for the community, too, but they don't do it in this practical kind of way. Yeah, you know, it's, I mean, it's the premise is they have to save self before you can save everyone else from right. the perspective. Right, right. It's probably like harder to keep it from being selfish. And, you know, I think, I think, I think you can have, you know, that, that, that trouble of, you know, dedicating your activity to your own selfishness or other people's service in anything. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anything. Yeah. I have a question about um, sort of how, about, I guess it's about instinct, really. So um, you combine all these different traditions and disciplines, which is something that I really resonate with, and I grew up with different sects of Buddhism, but also the, anyway. So I guess, and I, since I was young, I would develop my own rituals or own sort of things. And I guess I always didn't know what I was doing or just gauged what I was doing based on instinct. But I wonder if you could speak more to, like it was really useful for me to hear, like, I guess instinct meeting discipline and how to navigate your actions. You know? That's a very good question, and it's a it's a very, like I would really begin an investigation into that because instinct is very important, but you have to be careful because I, 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 there's instinct, and then sometimes there's things that are that are coloring instinct, mm -hmm. and so so you want to be able to to determine the 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 actual instinct, and then to just say, okay, well, am I doing this thing instinctually because I'm defending against something or, you know, I'm attached to something, you know. You have to, you have to tease out attachments and aversions from your instinct. But it's important to hold on to your instinct. At the, at the, and one of the big problems that people have is they have lost contact with their instinct. So it's, it's important to, to begin to honor that. And one thing that I would do, if this is something that you just decide to do, I would journey and ask to understand I would actually journey for a teacher of your instinct and have the teacher teach you about the nature of your instinct. And then I would ask a question about what kinds of involvements do I have with my instinct that are not native to it? And what do I need to do to remove those in order to gain more clarity? Like those, those are the kinds of questions you can ask in a journey. You see how powerful a path of working in this way. This is not the typical way to work with the journey. The, you know, again, shamans are usually gathering power, you know, focusing it, you know, to do this or that thing. They're not using it to necessarily develop these fine aspects of consciousness, which is what the Siddha does. But, see, I, I do bring them both together. <laughs> that is what I do. <laughs> so, and I think it's a very powerful way of working. And I don't know too many other teachers that are teaching this way. And the follow-up to this is that a, a other, if we wanted to go further, aside from taking your classes, into this work and into this world, like aside from the reading list that you provided, where is a good place to start? Or do you have recommendations of material and literature that you would say, you must read this, or you must go here? Or? I think I would enter into a formal experience of self-inquiry, whether that's, you know, with, with um, you know, again, I like the depth hypnosis practitioner idea, um, but I, I actually, I don't, I, as I say, I don't know of anyone else who's teaching exactly what I'm teaching, you know, like, um, I don't know of any, I'm sure there are other great teachers that are teaching shamanic work, but I don't know anyone who teaches shamanism in the way that I teach it. 
Okay. And of course, there's many great Buddhist teachers. I mean, you know, you could you could listen. You know, if you if you listen to Bob every day of your life, you will die enlightened. I swear. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know. But there are many other great teachers too. I mean, I would just continue your studies, and I, but I would really uh, develop a disciplined thing of self inquiry, whether that's through learning the journey better and, and then working with a, a guide to help you bounce ideas off and integrate it. I, 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 it seems like it's ordering to you. It seems like this whole thing has been ordering. You know, like you feel a little bit more ordered, right? I don't know if that, I'm reading that right or not. Is that right? So I would continue on this path. Yeah. I mean, again, it's not the only path. There are many paths to enlightenment. Yeah. Yes? Do you have any of your liquid this stuff? Oh yes, this is, I don't have it with me, but you can get it from our website, sacredstream.org. And there's space clearing number two, two. <laughs> that's, uh, that's for a little bit more heavy duty kinds of negative stuff. This is a general clear. But you can all, everybody want a little bit of spray before we go? <laughs> um, what was more heavy duty one? Uh, there's Gisa Space Clearing number two. Oh, okay. And it has uh, bergamot, frankincense, myrrh, uh -huh. black tourmaline in it. Um, and it's, uh, it's, you know, when you're dealing with very negative energies. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we, uh, you know, I like it. Yeah, I think I it. it's, it's very clarifying. A lot of people tell me that they give it to their kids before bed and that they sleep better. You know, that they have kids who have trouble sleeping, they'll spray their room and then they'll give something, they'll have a little ritual with the child and then they sleep better. So. Um, you would start clearing a room with, also with burning sage? Yes. Okay. Uh, sage is, I mean, I love this too and this is really good. Like if I go to Google or something like that, I can't burn sage when I go and give a talk. You know? So I, but I can spray this around a little bit when nobody's looking, you know. Um, oh. But sage is a very clearing. It's, it's something that's been used by Native Americans forever. Mm -hmm. And actually, one of the main uses of sage that the Plains Indians um, had was that they would burn a person's possessions after they had died with the sage mm -hmm. in order to erase any pathways. Uh, the, back to the earth plane so that the spirit would continue on its journey and wouldn't be drawn back. Oh, okay. And that's what the idea is with sage and with clearing is to erase imprints. To like you know if you you know if you've had a lot of things that have, if, like say if you've ever come into a hotel room and it feels really weird because there's probably something that happened there before that by burning sage or using this you erase that imprint and then you can rest. You know, I you don't know, enter into, I don't sleep anywhere I'm talking to this, you know, but, um, but I mean, or else you come into a room where there's something has happened and you're like, what's going on, you know, there's a psychic imprint there holding the energy. Uh -huh. So you clear it with the sage and this? And this, yeah. yeah. And you can also use other, other kinds of herbs. There's other kinds of cleansing herbs like mugwort or artemisia or sweetgrass. Mm -hmm. But I, I like sage. Sage is like, Heavy duty. I know. The, um, in the Buddhist tradition, they burn a lot of incense. Yes. So it's the same it's idea. It's the same idea. And the incense is made of different types of plants that have yes. different types of clearing or curing properties. Uh -huh. And you would recommend this if we go on a journey on our own, we would burn? I would recommend clearing space. Like if you're going uh -huh. to start a journey practice or a meditation practice, I think it's always a good idea to clear space. You can also clear it with sound. You know, like you could, that's why you often see in tradition they'll ring a bell before that because the, that the sound is clearing. Mm -hmm. And it will also dispel imprints. Mm -hmm. So you could do that. You could, yes, I create a ritual, like, mm -hmm. a, you know, with sound or rub lighting a candle, lighting incense. Mm -hmm. The incense that I use, the pot, this is pine and sandalwood. Mm -hmm. And pine is really helpful for. Uh, uh, and sandalwood are both more for like physical vibration kinds of things. Like bring, they bring a lot of clarity in, more and more into the lower vibratory fields, mm -hmm. which is why I use that to set. I use the sage to clear, mm -hmm. and I use the pine and the sandalwood to set. 
uh -huh. to hold the intention of what we're going to be doing in the space. Okay. The whole the whole study of space management is very important and mm -hmm. um, it is something that we cover in the applied shamanism mm -hmm. study. Mm -hmm. It is very important. Okay. It creates the right container for things. All right, well, I think we're going to close circle for the last time. The sun is a circle. The sun is a circle. The moon is a circle. The moon is a circle. The earth is a circle. The earth is a circle. The drum is a circle. The drum is a circle. We are a circle within a circle. We are a circle within a circle. Just taking a moment to feel your guide from the shamanic journey behind you. Feeling Vajrasattva behind your guide. And then feeling White Tara behind Vajrasattva. We are a circle within their circle. We are in a circle within your circle. And the power of the circle remains in non-ordinary reality. You can call upon it at any time. Beauty before me. Beauty before me. Beauty behind me. Beauty behind me. Beauty to my left side. Beauty to my left side. Beauty to my right side. Beauty to my right side.